Remember that time Valve hadn't made a game for like 10 years and then casually out of nowhere Gabe goes, here you go. What? I still can't believe how casually Valve announced their new addition to the Half-Life universe. We've had a decade of code leaks and lost art and so much secrecy and then we get this? Yeah, nah, I'm cool with that. Adieu, je buzz, pour City 17. And what an incredible return it is. The Source 2 engine takes City 17 and brings it up to scratch to the modern age of visuals we are accustomed to nowadays. What didn't need to be updated, however, was Valve's organic storytelling and world building, which is the same as it always has been, because they've had it right pretty much since the start. What do I mean? 1998, Half-Life 1. Valve could have just made another generic Quake clone like everyone else was doing, where you run around and shoot a bunch of aliens or zombies or, I don't know, Hitler in a mech, but when they decided to add friendly non-playable characters in the form of scientists, they found that the playtesters quickly began to care for these AI. Stemming from there, Half-Life was soon littered with a bunch of these NPCs, and the beginning of Half-Life, a first-person shooter, was now dedicated to showing the mundane daily rituals of the scientists at Black Mesa, which in turn made the intro to the game fantastical. Even today, there is something so gorgeous to watch about slowly travelling through the facility, seeing scientists run around and build rockets. It gets the player thinking, what are they doing? What is that rocket for? Where are we? When you get off the train, you were free to just run around and explore the facility. Despite being minimal interactions, doing things such as talking to scientists, inspecting locker rooms and blowing up lunches gives the players a sense of familiarity and makes you invested into the world. Valve has cleverly coerced the player into caring for their environment, which will come in handy later for when- Ah oh, shit! Oh fuck! I pressed the wrong button! Fuck! I'm gonna lose my fucking job! Hello, Centrelink. Because you have just run around and dicked about the facility for the last 20 minutes, when Valve turns the game on its head and it becomes a survival horror, you already know the level design and additionally, you care because these scientists were being friendly with you. Please, leave me alone until after the experiment. Okay, well like, like a professional friendly. But enough that shitty ass blocky Half-Life 1, look at the graphics! <laughs> Let's get to the big boys, Half-Life 2. This game is maybe Valve's world building at its absolute best, and Valve knows this. That's why they put the best part of the game at the very start. City 17 is a masterclass in how to tell a story through visuals. After G-Man's recap of the first game, you are placed on a train. Immediately, the visuals of the world give you context on what is happening. The train is empty and dirty, and these two men look miserable and are in the same uniform blue. Something's not adding up. When you stop, this guy says apprehensively, well. End of the line. You step outside into the dusty warehouse train stop, and when you look up, you see Dr. Wallace Breen. The placement of his screen, so high and mighty, and taking up so much room, all dedicated to his face, is the final piece to the puzzle, to the authoritarian state the city is in. As you continue, you notice a civil protection officer bullying a citizen, immediately establishing to the player their role of power and authority. The civil protection metro cops are all donned in the same intimidating uniform, which also gets the player thinking. What is that uniform? Is it from Earth? If they are humans, why do they have these gas masks on their helmets? What happened to normal cops? What happened to everyone? You can turn around and witness a Vortigaunt, an enemy in the last game, being forced to pathetically mop the ground, which shows that this new force, who or whatever it may be, has strict rule over not only the human race, but other species as well. The citizens are key to why this all works and is believable. As you pass them, they give distressing comments like, Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. I don't even remember how I got here. You see them submissively wait in line for paperwork or food supplies or something unknown to the player. And where this section gets incredible is when you open these doors. Whoa. Again, we see Dr. Breen's high risen face, but more interestingly, we see the Citadel, a giant alien looking structure with its metallic blue color clashing harshly with the bleak and dreary yellows and browns of the human city. The placement of these two objects tells the player a couple of things. While Dr. Breen is overcharged of the humans, something else, probably alien, is overlooking him. And how do we know it's aliens? Oh, okay, yeah, the Earth is fucked. We're run by aliens now. In all of Valve's world, they follow one rule, show, don't tell. And through this, you continue to piece together the world you're in. For example, instead of Gordon going up to these two guys and them saying, Oh hey Gordon, the cops are doing a raid. Because where is the magic in that? Instead, they fearfully tell you. Well, they have no reason to come to our place. Don't worry, they'll find one. And then you get to experience the Metro Cops raids firsthand. You see people crying and people fleeing. You experience the oppression firsthand. And then you get to throw this TV out of a fucking window, so that's pretty cool. There is also an overruling voice through the PA systems of City 17 called Overwatch. If you sit and listen to some of the things they say, it's super interesting. Most notably... Attention, residents. Miscount detected in your block. Cooperation with your civil protection team permits full ration reward. 
It just adds that little bit more of depth to the oppression of the citizens. If they do not comply, their food rations are taken away. Just sitting around and listening to people talk in this game reveals so, so much. Like Dr. Breen's many political speeches designed to indoctrinate the citizens. One of the most interesting things he says is how the human race has been prohibited from recreating due to a suppression field, which we find out he is referring to the creation of the transhuman combine, humans who have been forcefully turned into combine soldiers. When you do meet the main cast of characters, you can sit obediently and listen to them, or you can be a normal person and look around the room. In Dr. Kleiner's lab, you can witness scientific instruments, a miniature version of the teleporter you were about to use, this picture of Black Mesa scientists with someone's face scratched out, presumably Dr. Breen. And most interestingly, in Black Mesa East, there is a news article titled The Seven Hour War. This one news article is maybe the most interesting nugget of information in the entire Half-Life universe. It has infinitely fascinated me. The idea that aliens unexpectedly come to Earth and we surrender to their sheer power in under seven hours. Insane. Such an amazing concept. My favorite parts of this game weren't the shooting or the puzzles or the shitty ass stupid ammo. Fuck! It was the moments when I got to look around at the world and piece together its history. My absolute favorite is on Mr. Breen's mono rail. Akin to Half Life's opening, it takes you slowly through the alien infrastructure which has haunted you for the entire game. You see these awful looking creatures doing engineering work and you see the inner mechanics of the Citadel. Brilliant. Valve uses this trick of putting something in the background for you to be constantly reminded of again in episode 2, where the combine portal beautifully looms over the destroyed City 17. It acts both as a beautiful set piece and as a reminder of your overall objective. Valve's following of this show don't tell rule is what makes the world feel so interesting, memorable and organic. They didn't need to go through all this effort, but it adds depth and texture to the world and leaves a lingering impression in the player's mind, making them think of the things they've seen for hours and hours after they've stopped playing the game, which is exactly what I did. In Valve's subsequent series, Portal, which coincidentally takes place in the same universe, Valve once again utilizes these excellent techniques to build the world of Aperture Laboratories. The testing facility in Aperture Science is sterilized white and clean, yet sometimes gross bits of blunk spill from the corners. Everything is symmetrical in its rectangular panels upon the wall, and overlooking you are these blurred out office cubicles. They evoke a sense of mystery in the player, as there is no one watching. It's almost haunting. What's more spooky is the voice of the overwatching AI GLaDOS. From the get-go, something seems not so right as her voice clips fizz out and break. Please refrain from <laughs> The first time you realize something is wrong wrong, it is in Test Chamber 16, where two weighted storage cubes pry open a panel in the wall, and when you walk into it, there are crazy messages all over the walls, empty cans of beans, and the sterilized clean testing tracks facade is broken as we get to see the inner workings of the laboratory. Throughout the game you keep seeing these dents, the cake is a lie, and all these other messages left by the crazy Doug Ratman, a former employee of Aperture Science. Okay, something definitely isn't right. And then, you see it for yourself. <laughs> As you go and escape the facility, you are now surrounded in the abandoned, drowned in red, industrialized back alleys of Aperture, avoiding metal plates, pins, and doing everything you can to escape the facility. When you get to GLaDOS, she says one thing in particular, which instantly adds so much depth to the world. Are you trying to escape? <laughs> <laughs> Things have changed since the last time you left the building. What's going on out there will make you wish you were back in here. I have an infinite capacity for knowledge, and even I'm not sure what's going on outside. All I know is I'm the only thing standing between us and them. Wow. What a cool line. It adds the idea that GLaDOS, however evil she is, is the only barricade between you and the oppressive invasive rule of the Combine. That's such a sick idea. And then in Portal 2, it ramps up tenfold. To avoid story complications, Portal 2 takes place tens of thousands of years in the future. Because of this, we yet again get to visually see the changes of the world. There's overgrown plants, rusted and cracked buildings, and overall, the entire facility has an abandoned feel. Now here's where the soundtrack of the Portal series is at its most excellent. Listen to this track. Notice how the angelic and naturalistic harp clashes with the robotic beeps? This is the soundtrack's way of reflecting the now collision between the overgrown floor and the robotic science facility, with the harps and the beeps representing the former and latter. It gives the area you explore an almost fairy tale like feeling, invoking the wonder and amazement inspired by these paintings of Chell painted by the Ratman. The Ratman continues to haunt the facilities, as if you put your ear up to some walls, you can hear a disturbed voice.
the visual design in Portal 2 is overall a lot more brilliant. As I mentioned before, the overgrown plants show the passage of time, but it's in the small details as well, such as the slight aging of the once white as a canvas portal gun, or the absolute wreckages that take place of the test team as you once completed. In terms of the lore though, Portal 2 brilliantly expands its world through visual design, such as when we get to the old Aperture facilities. Obviously it is old, but how do we know this? Because you get this old retro logo, the miniature designs of the tracks, and these old computers. Also everything is breaking apart because of age. And then to mix it in with the fantastical sci-fi that Valve does so well, we get these giant spherical testing rooms. Introducing this idea that in the 60s, they said, let's chuck them all in these big spheres. It is always the design of the place that lets you know of what has happened, not some character mouthing off about it. I also love how Valve juxtaposes the brilliantly clean and fresh robotic of the new aperture with the design of the old. It reflects and matches the narrative we were presented. Less humans, more robots. There are many, many more examples across all of Valve's games on why they are still maybe the top dog on storytelling. If they decide to make more games in the future, which god I hope they do, we won't have to worry about having our hand held through the amazing creations we find ourselves venturing through. Basically, Valve is very good at this. Hey guys, I hope you liked the more chill analytical video. I'm still developing my style and I don't know whether I should be more serious or comedic or whatever. Please let me know in the comments what you think and please let me know what you thought of this video. Did you like the things I brought up? Is there something I missed? Whatever it is, drop a comment and of course let me know how I, as always, exude big virgin energy. Stay snug. See ya.